Thank you, Chris, for leading us in song leading. Our scripture reading tonight will be from Romans chapter 8. Grab your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 8. I'll begin reading in verse 5 from the New American Standard Bible. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. The question I would like to start off our lesson for this evening presenting to you is, are you out of your mind? Another way that that could be phrased is, are you a sandwich short of a picnic? Are you a slice short of a loaf? Are you a brick short of a load? Does the elevator not go all the way to the top? Lights on, but nobody's home. No, <laughs> that's not what I mean by, are you out of your mind? But what is your mindset? What is important to you? Uh, there was a song years ago, Crazy, Crazy for Feeling. And maybe that's more along the lines of where we're going with our lesson this evening. But you and I have both experienced times where we are focused within our lives that it just consumes us. You know, we are so intent on a accomplishing a certain task or maybe it's to go on a trip or win the heart of that special someone, but everything else just seems to fade into the background. We, we become so intent on our mind set upon accomplishing that goal that it seems like everything else just pales in comparison. The answer to the question, are you out of your mind, I believe should be answered by us from 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16 towards the latter part of that verse where Paul says, but we have the mind of Christ. What does that mean? And how do we get there? How do we accomplish that? I think that the solution is fairly simple within its formula. It's the carrying it out that can often baffle us. Let's look again closely at this verse that we just read here in Romans chapter 8. He first of all says, if you have your mind set on those things that are of the flesh, there's something that is wrong with your life. Verse 5 again, for those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit, for the mind set on the flesh is death. Now, the flesh represents, in the context of this particular passage, anything that is contrary to that which is godly. And, in fact, those two words are used over and over. Again, flesh and spirit. Now, you can, with your right hand, reach over to your left arm and you can pinch that, right? And that is flesh, that is physical, that is carnal, and it is very easy for us to get focused upon our physical needs. But what do we know as we grow and as we mature into adults that that cannot be our sole focus in life? Otherwise, we're not going to love anybody else. We are only going to love ourselves. The mind that is set upon the flesh does not have within its grasp, within its focus, those things that are of the spirit, those things that are eternal. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't take care care of our bodies. That doesn't mean that we don't feed ourselves like we ought to properly. That doesn't mean that we don't clothe ourselves whenever we get cold. What it means is that I don't make that my sole focus. I don't make that my reason for living because if it is, if, if that becomes that, what have I neglected? I have neglected my soul, the spirit that God has placed within me, his spirit, the Holy Spirit, and my creator. And so Paul rightly concludes if all you're thinking about is yourself, you're going to die, and you're going to die ultimately eternally. 
Uh, it doesn't matter how well we take care of our bodies, uh, that we know that these bodies are, are frail. You, now, you may live to be 80 years old, perhaps 90 years old, maybe 100. I hesitate to go any further than that. Uh, because what do we know about ourselves? Like James says, uh, what is your life? It is but a vapor. It's here for a little while, and then it's gone. By contrast, the mind that is set upon the spirit, what does it say? In verse 7, I want you to look at this again, okay? Uh, think of the contrast of what he is saying. And at the end of verse 6, he says, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Verse 7, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not subject itself to the law of God, for it, doesn't, it is not even able to do so. The mind that is set upon the spirit seeks to make God its friend, seeks to make him his friend, not his enemy. I'd hate to ever be an, an enemy of God, not, not hostile towards him, but seeking to know what is the reason that I have been made. Not simply why am I living and breathing, but I, I, I have these, these strengths that I have been given. I have this body. I have this ability. I've been placed within this age, uh, within this location at this time. I want to know what it is that I am supposed to do, not to simply gratify those selfish desires, but to have a devotion that is upon God and upon pleasing him, upon serving others. And Paul is saying then to the Christians... You basically set aside that fleshly mindset. Now, the world would say, that is crazy. That <laughs> you, you are out of your head if you are going to focus your whole life upon that which is unseen, upon that which is spiritual, upon that which is eternal. And so he says to them, look at verse 9, talking to these Christians, he says to them, however, you are not in the flesh but are in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of God, he does not belong to him. You are in the flesh, which is sinful nature. You're not in that, he says, but you are in the spirit. Now, uh, that might be a little bit baffling to us at first because we can think, well, how am I not in the flesh? I, I have to be in the flesh in order that I read this. And sometimes we even use that type of phrase whenever we see somebody walk in. We're like, oh, there's so-and-so, and they will say, uh, in the flesh. And what they are meaning is not that they are full of sin, although that is what Paul is saying here. You're not living just for yourself any longer. You're not focused, you're, you don't have this mindset that is only upon your selfish lust and, and desires. No, you have God's spirit. Sometimes you see this idea of spirit written on gym walls or on uh, uh, gymnasium floors, this idea of we've got spirit. Yes, we do, right? We've got spirit. What is, what is that form, spirit, little s, there? What is, what is the context of, of that kind of spirit? Well, that is a common goal, right? That is unity. That is enthusiasm. That's this idea of everyone headed the same direction in order that they might accomplish a goal that they are unable to do on their own. That's right. Uh, be not unequally yoked, as Paul says. Paul says, as Christians, we have that which unites us towards a common goal, and that is pleasing God. His spirit reigning over us. And so Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 2 and verse 16, but we have the mind of Christ. He is not saying that we know everything that Jesus knows, right? He, he's not saying that whenever we are baptized that some sort of a mystical surgery took place where our brains were removed and, and Christ's mind is put in, is he? What he is saying is, is that we think about things the way that God would have us to perceive them. We have this goal that is unseen by the naked eye, but is clearly seen by the mind of faith. We have the mind of Christ. In that, whenever Christ was about to leave his disciples, soon to be apostles, he said, I have to leave in order that the helper might come, that the spirit uh, of the, the comforter, the, the counselor, he is going to remind you of all of those things that I have taught you over the years, and you will know what God's will is and just how to accomplish it. We have the mind of Christ. If God had left us in the dark about his will and about our purpose, then man truly would be lost. 
Uh, we can willfully, man can, walk in darkness and in sin. But the hope that we have, the, what Paul is alluding to here, is that we find that within Christ, within his teachings. And that has been delivered. That sacrifice that he gave, the spirit, has been delivered to us. It has been accomplished. And so Paul says, look at it again. We're going to start in verse 9 and continue to read from there. However, you are not in the flesh but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. And if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who indwells you. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading again into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified. Peter says something very similar in 1 Peter chapter 4 to what Paul said just there at the end. Whenever he says, arm yourself with this same thought, that could also be translated, arm yourself with this same mind. He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Look at again what Paul says, not Peter, but Paul here in verse 17 where he says towards the latter part, if indeed we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified in him. Paul is saying, if I have a focus upon things that are really important, and I am willing to even share in suffering for righteousness' sake, if that is my mindset because I share in his suffering, then I will also share in his glory whenever he comes. What kind of mindset, what type of mindset does that take for one to be willing to suffer for a lifestyle? for a cause, for the truth. It takes a dedicated one, doesn't it? You, you look at what the first and second century Christians endured, as Mark pointed out to us on our Wednesday night Devo, and it is horrific. Do you not think that they loved your, their bodies? Like, you love your bodies? Do, do you think they were sadistic, or in, in some way they, they loved the pain? wasn't any of that. They loved the Lord more, though. The, their focus was not upon the flesh, which is death. Their, their minds were set upon Christ. They were full of the Spirit of God. They were willing to suffer in order that they might share within his glory. Paul says simply, set your mind on things above. Turn with me to that passage in Colossians chapter 3. He's been talking to brethren here in Colossae that are baptized. They have become children of God. And what he is telling them is, yes, uh, you were forgiven of your sins whenever you were raised from that watery grave of baptism, but there is more that is expected than a simple cleansing. You have been raised for a reason. And think about the connection between what he says here and what Paul says in Romans chapter 6, that you have been raised to walk a new life. Have that in mind as we read. We're going to begin in verse 1 of Colossians chapter 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on things of this earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Whenever you became a Christian, was there a reason that you did? Whenever you confessed that Jesus is the Christ to the glory of God the Father and repented of your sins and you accepted that avenue 
of the watery grave of baptism to wash your sins away. Was there a reason? Were, were you only interested in the benefits? Or did you realize, yes, I, I am receiving the benefits of having the forgiveness of sins, the, the hope of eternal life, but I have now been cleansed to serve. I've been raised to walk a new life. But that new life's not easy, is it? Habits die hard. And we can very easily find ourselves, if we're not careful, like a truck with bald tires falling back into the rut and having a difficult time getting back out again. When we are baptized, when we are cleansed, we are put in a, a frame of mind that is supposed to draw us out of that, that those habits that we once indulged in are no longer a part of our life. Paul says simply what that requires initially, and I believe constantly, is setting our minds not upon the things of this earth, not upon fleshly and carnal and physical things, but upon the Spirit and upon the Lord. Set your mind upon things above where Christ is seated, at the right hand of the throne of God. And if you keep your mind set there, like the Hebrew writer says, and we continue that running that race, seeking after Christ, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith, being willing to suffer for righteousness sake, then I will also share with him in his glory. Listen, it's not going to be an easy life though, as, as a Christian, you are going to be ridiculed. Otherwise, if you're not, are you better than your master? That's what they did to him. You, you are going to have friends that no longer understand why you are the way you are. And, and they might even consider you to be, you know, a, a little bit out, out of your mind. And that's okay. Because you have the mind of Christ. You see things differently. Things that used to be a pleasure to you now, now are an abhorrent. Peter asked, you know, what profit, what gain was there in those things that now you are ashamed of? What, what type of profit did you ever gain from those things? You, you have set those things aside so that you can incorporate those virtues of Christ within your life when he says, deny ungodliness. Uh, turn with me to a passage in second, uh, or the second chapter of Titus uh, in verse 12. Paul says to both Timothy and to Titus, uh, deny ungodliness. What does that mean? Look at this passage in Titus Chapter 2 and verse 12. Instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. That word deny means to disavow. It means to reject, to refuse, to disown, to disregard one's own selfish interests in light of what? Pleasing Christ. That, that truly is a different mindset. That, that is how one is able to persevere under persecution, under trials, and still remain faithful because it's no longer about me. It's about God and what he desires out of me. And I, I pray that that is my attitude. I pray that I say more and more, not my will, but thy will be done on a daily basis. But there is a source of all of this, okay? Turn back with me to Colossians again. Look again at verse 10, where we just were. He says, And have put on the new self, who is being renewed to the true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. We have all experienced enlightenment to some degree or another. We're not all simpletons in here like myself, right? We're not all, all dunderheads. We've all experienced those times within our lives where we have been uh, given knowledge that no longer is a certain way of doing something uh, a mystery to us. And a little light bulb goes off within our head. But even as we get within that frame of mind and we begin to understand things more clearly, especially those within the spiritual realm, we still encounter those who don't quite grasp those concepts in which we are or have already come to understand. How does that light go off? How does that light turn on? Applied knowledge. Listen, it's where knowledge has finally reached wisdom 
in understanding the litmus test is whether I am willing to incorporate it and to perform it. Paul says, the way that my mind is changed is that I constantly infuse it with the knowledge of him for whom I live. Would I become more like Christ within my daily life? Then I need to know more about him and, and know him better and better. And in the process of coming to know him, and applying those things that he desires within my life, my life is changed. My life is renewed. As Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, don't conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the way I do it. It's no longer am I stumbling about in, in ignorance and in my own selfish desires, but now I have truth, and that source is Christ. Do you know what we sometimes get into trying to do? We want to be the ones that decide and come up with it ourselves. We want to be the ones that sit back and meditate. We want to be those that decipher, you know, what, what all the world's about. We want to be those discoverers of everything that is right and that is good. Well, where is that focus once again placed? It's right, right upon us. And we're right back into that mouse in the maze trying to get to the cheese. You ever see those uh, little experiments that scientists do for whatever reason that they do them where they put a mouse in a maze and yeah, it is kind of neat that they can go through that maze and accomplish a certain task just to get to the very end and get to the cheese. But where are you whenever you're watching all of that kind of overhead, you know, looking down and thinking, well, that's, that's a little bit silly. Uh, that's kind of mundane, isn't it? Isn't that where we are whenever we just follow our own intricate paths within our minds about our selfish desires and our lust. It's like what uh, Solomon was doing with Ecclesiastes as he was saying this pursuit or that pursuit, it, it, it's all meaningless. The only way that we can have true knowledge, that which is right, that which is true, is that which is given to us through the Spirit of God and it has been revealed. And accepting this as truth, not just accepting it, believing this as truth, not just believing it, pursuing it, preaching it. That is the mind of Christ. Will we ever exhaust all that God has to give us? No. No. Never. And we're not God, but we can know enough. The eunuch knew enough within an afternoon to confess Christ as Lord and to be baptized and to go on his way rejoicing. But that was the beginning of a lifelong endeavor. Look again, verse 10 and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Paul says it this way. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. The same idea, the same concept, starting in verse 20. Paul has already encouraged them to live a life worthy of their calling. He says, beginning in verse 20 of Ephesians chapter 4, but you didn't learn Christ in this way, if indeed you have learned or you have heard him and you have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and you put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Paul's telling us a secret here, isn't he? Remember, it's not so much the formula, the solution, as it is the application of it, and it's because it is a continual application. Paul is saying that would we be more like God, then we need to learn more about him and make application in the things that we learn. Renew your spirit with the spirit of God because that spirit that he has provided is that which is pure and holy and righteous, and it's here. We have it. It's within the word. You know, Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3, God in his divine wisdom and power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That is an apostle towards the end of his life writing the last letter that we are aware of saying God has delivered it. It's here. It's within. It's in, in what we have presented to you. And what he told the brethren is I am writing it down for what reason? I'm writing it down so that whenever I'm gone, that you will know 
in which way that you ought to live. Brethren, we have it. It's been delivered to it. It is that which makes us, by the power of God, by, by his forgiveness, it's what transform our lives and changes us. You've experienced it within your own lives, by degree or increments, some of us drastically, that becoming a Christian cleansed us of all of our guilt. We no longer were somebody that was so caught up in our own selfish and, and not caring about anybody else. But once that sin was removed, we, we have a more clear thing, thought process uh, about people and about the way that God loves them. And, and my pursuit is not about me. It's about serving God in, in service to others. Shouldn't forgiveness be a very easy concept for us to understand as Christians? That that is what God wants to be to me, is forgiving so that I can be that way for others. Above all, putting on Love. Love is doing what is best for another, regardless of the cost, how you're treated in, in return, whether you are appreciated or not, that's Christ on the cross. Do I have the mind of Christ? I will serve. I will do. It doesn't matter who sees it or if I get any applause or any appreciation for it. I, I will do because I have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. I want to close with a passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You say, whoo, he's finally almost done. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul's trying to defend his ministry. And he knows within the mind of some that he is a fanatic. And boy, is he he's dedicated, isn't he? I mean, this fella left his home and, and country in order to go anywhere that you he felt that God would have him to go and he was willing to suffer whatever the populace of that town or country that he went to dealt his way whether it was chasing him out of town or beating him with rods or, or even stoning him and leaving him for dead all of that Paul continues to preach and so I think there's a little bit of tongue in cheek in what he is saying here because basically he is saying if I'm out of my mind it's for a reason. Look at verse 13 specifically whenever we get there but beginning in verse 11 therefore knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are not, but we are made manifest to God, and I hope that we are made manifest also in your conscience. We are not again commending ourselves to you, but we are giving you an, an occasion to be proud of us, that you may have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Paul says, I understand now why I am who I am and what my purpose is in life. He says, I I know no longer am I supposed to be seeking after my, my selfish desires. I live for Christ and for Christ alone. And if that makes me crazy, then so be it. Paul recognized, I, I am of sound mind. He says, if you recognize that I, I am of sound mind, then you know that the things that I am speaking of are from God and that they are of the Spirit. And so this evening, as we leave the auditorium tonight, uh, you have a judgment to make. Um, have you understood everything that was said here? Have you perceived the precepts? Now, I know that I am weak and I am frail and I don't do near as good of a job as what I need to in presenting God's word, but by and large, have you understand the argument that, that Paul is making here? Are you out of your mind? Listen, if it's for the cause of Christ, then good. <laughs> Go crazy. Please him. Be seen by the world as being fanatics, as being out of touch with reality. I, you can be out of touch with that reality because that reality is the ways of the flesh. And so much so be a fanatic that you are willing to suffer, that you are willing to be persecuted, even beaten, or confiscation of goods, or imprisoned, or even death, because if you share with him in his suffering, you will also share with him in his glory. Is he your master? Are you in your right mind as we stand and as we sing?